Good morning, Dr. Blair. Good morning. How are you, sir? Okay. Good. What, would you please state your full name on the record? Aaron Earl Blair. All right, sir. And Aaron Earl Blair, you're a doctor. PhD. PhD. You've got, I'm going to start and go through a little bit of your credentials, if I may, sir. Sure. Okay. You graduated in 1965 with a degree in biology from uh, Kansas Wesleyan University? Yes. Master of Science degree in 67 from North Carolina State University? Yes. And a PhD in genetics at North Carolina State University? Yes. And then in 1976 you got an MPH. What is an MPH? Master's in Public Health. And that's, you, your CV says epidemiology? Correct. Okay, and what is epidemiology? Yeah, the study of causes and distribution of diseases. Have you, have you been professionally since 1976 studying the causes of diseases? Yes. And explain it to me if you would. Where and how have you been studying the causes of diseases since 1976? Study um, disease in human populations, uh, evaluating um, various factors that might be related to the initiation or etiology of those diseases. As the, you say you've spent your professional life with this doctorate degree studying the causes of diseases, have you studied the causes of cancer? Yes. And within the broad field of studying the causes of cancer, have you studied the causes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yes. Now it sounds like you spend an awful lot of time at the National Cancer Institute. Is that right? Yes. What is the National Cancer Institute? It is one of the institutes, the National Institutes of Health, devoted to studying cancer. And you started there uh, in 1976? Yes. And how long did you stay there? From 1976 until when? Are you still there? Are you retired? Or I am retired now, but I have an emeritus position, which means I go in a couple days a week and do what I've always done. I just don't get paid. <laughs> All right, so you started there in 1976. You were a staff fellow for the Environmental Epidemiology Branch at the National Cancer Institute. Correct. Went on 1978 to 82, became the acting chief of the Occupational Studies Section of the Environmental Epidemiology Branch, National Cancer Institute. Yes. Describe for us what it is you're doing there. And Studying various sorts of exposures that occur in occupations and to see if they're related to cancer. All right, let's go on then. You became the chief of the occupational study section in 1982, right? Yes. Okay. Remained the chief for, and I'll do this math, 14 years until 1996. Sounds right. Is exhibit one a copy of your CV or curriculum vitae, okay? Is this your CV, sir? Yes. All right. So. After being the chief for 14 years at the Occupational Environmental Epidemiology Branch, you went on to become, in, in 2004, a senior investigator. Please tell us what that means. It means I stepped down as head of the unit and just retained a position at the National Cancer Institute, and that is a senior position. Okay, and then you retired from full-time work there in 2007. Yes. And have been working for free as a professor emeritus there ever since. Yes. Who is who? <clears throat> World Health Organization. Could you uh, just let the jury know some of those groups that you've served at the request uh, and for the World Health Organization? Well, the main the one is the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the World Health Organization. Okay. Is that also referred to as IARC? Correct. Did there come a time when you were asked to be involved with the World Health Organization, the International Association of Cancer, to what is now become volume 112 of the monograph? Yes. All right, so what we have here, can you identify this document, which is Exhibit 2, please? Well, it is one of the monographs. All right, I'll go, if you would, sir, to the first page of the preamble, and it says here that the IARC was established in, in 1965. Is that your understanding? Yes. It says through the IARC, I'm sorry, I'll quote it exactly. Through the monographs program, IARC seeks to identify the causes of human cancer. That's true, isn't it, sir? Yes. And there's 
and a preamble, a discussion of the selection of agents for review by IARC. And I want to ask you about it. It says agents are selected for review. Is that for review to see if they cause cancer? Uh, yes. On the basis of two main criteria. There is evidence of human exposure, and there is some evidence or suspicion of carcinogenicity. Uh, is that your understanding, Dr. Blair? Yes. And IARC has in this preamble a discussion of what they'll review as they consider these issues, right, sir? Yes. Only reports that have been published or accepted for publication in openly available scientific literature are reviewed. Is that true, sir? Uh, yes. And why is that true? Why, why does IARC only review those publications that have been published in available scientific literature or have been accepted for publication? Because it, these materials are then available to anyone. And IARC also reviews as exposure data? Yes. And exposure data means how are humans exposed to that agent, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and IARC extends invitations to scientists around the world to participate in the creation of a monograph for a book, right? Yes. And it, in this preamble, it tells us before an invitation is extended, each potential applicant, a participant, including the IARC secretariat, completes a WHO declaration of interest to report financial interest, employment, and consulting, and individual and institutional research support related to the subject of the meeting. Is that your understanding? Yes. So before these folks are invited to be on this IARC panel, they have to declare their interest. Yes. It says in this monograph uh, preamble that a working group, and I want to ask you, what is a working group? It's the group of people invited to perform this activity. Okay. And the working group meets at IARC for seven to eight days to discuss and finalize the text and to formulate the evaluation. Is that your experience? Uh, roughly that number of days. Page nine, there's a whole section, and I'm not going to read it, but that IARC considers the quality of studies considered, right? Yes. Okay. And then on page 10, IARC considers meta-analysis? Yes. Now, could you tell the jury what is a meta-analysis? It is a quantitative or statistical way of summing up results from several studies. Okay. And does IARC not only consider meta-analysis that are available in the public literature, but does IARC, in fact, do their own meta-analysis? Sometimes. Does IARC also review pooled analysis? Yes. Going, if we would, to page 11 in the preamble for IARC, it tells us that they use a criteria to establish causality, right, sir? Yes. It says in the preamble for IARC, if the risk increases with exposure, this is considered a strong indication of causality. Is that true, sir? Yes. Okay. The IARC also considers studies of cancer in experimental animals? Yes. Page 15. There's, in the preamble, they discuss that IARC considers mechanistic and other relevant data. Is that right, sir? Yes. And after, even before this uh, seven uh, to nine day working group meeting in France, does the working group review materials in the time before that? Um, the individuals on the working group yes. review materials before that. Okay. And for what period of time, approximately, do individuals in the working group review material? A um, couple months, okay. three months. It's okay. a while. And there are different categories. There's one, two A, two B, three, that sort of thing? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Category 2A is the agent 
is probably carcinogenic to humans, right? Yes. And carcinogenic means uh, causes cancer, right? Yes. Okay, so, and we're going to talk about it in more detail, but you were selected for uh, the working group that looked at Roundup. Yes. And at your group, I think there were 17 scientists on that group? Sounds about. But that group decided that Roundup and glyphosate was probably carcinogenic to humans, right? Yes. And the meeting occurred in Lyon, France, March 3rd through 10th, 2015, right? Yes. And the list of participants, I'd like to go over it for a while, if I could, um, included Aaron Blair, National Cancer Institute, retired. That's you, right, sir? Yes. From the United States of America. And you were the overall chair of the group, weren't you? Yes. Okay. How much did they pay you for that? Uh, we're not paid. It's a volunteer assignment, isn't it? Yes. So you reviewed all these materials for months, right? Yes. Spent seven to nine days. No, I'm sorry. It looks like seven days reviewing these materials with these other scientists. And you volunteered and did it all for free. Other than travel expenses. So how many subgroups are there or were there in this particular group? Four. And there were people from the Environmental Protection Agency who volunteered and served on this uh, panel that concluded that glyphosate uh, was a probable cause of human uh, cancer. Yeah. And you think it was unanimous, but you're not 100% sure. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Now, now, I wanted to ask you, an invited specialist, what is an invited specialist? Uh, maybe if someone brings special expertise that would be of value to the working group. But an invitation was extended to Christopher Portier, who was from the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry in the United States. Yes. And there were observers at the meeting. Now, what's the function of an observer? There it usually means they're sort of stakeholders in the issue being evaluated. Okay. And the Monsanto company was allowed to have an observer at the meeting, weren't they, sir? Uh, yeah. That was a Dr. Thomas Sorhan, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And did he, was he allowed to speak up at the meeting? Yes. All right. So after this uh, selection of these 17 people, the IR uh, put together, you were the chairman months of review, a seven-day meeting, there was a report issued. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. Let's take a look at what I believe to be the IARC report for glyphosate. This is the report from IARC for glyphosate. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup? Yes. IARC studied, obviously, the drug in humans and studied it in exposed humans. That's a fair statement. So you not only chaired the entire panel, but you sub-chaired the epidemiology section. I was on the epidemiology. Okay, I'm sorry. Was there a sub-chair? There was. Let's look at the epidemiology. Going to page 78 of your report, cancer in humans, we're on page 78, you see this doctor? It says there is limited evidence in humans for carcinogenicity and glyphosate. A positive association has been observed for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What does a positive association mean, sir? It means there were studies that showed uh, an excess risk for people exposed. And that would include the epidemiological studies that were uh, done. Yes. The report goes on to say there is strong evidence that exposure to glyphosate or glyphosate-based formulations is genotoxic based on studies in humans in vitro and studies in experimental animals. That's what your uh, 17 expert committee... Yes. So then moving on in time, the next study we see on your chart for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is a study by DeRus in 2003, right? Yeah. Okay. And Dr. DeRus and others in this peer-reviewed journal studied people who were exposed to glyphosate in Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, Kansas from the period 1979 to 1986, right? Yes. And what they found was that there was a 
over a doubling of the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma for people who had been exposed to glyphosate, right? Yes. Is this, is this finding of a doubling of the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, is it statistically significant? Yes. Is this one of the pieces of evidence upon which your committee based their opinion there was a positive association between exposure to glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yes. There was a study from Canada called the McDuff study, right sir? Yes. And they examined people who had been exposed to glyphosate from 1991 to 1994, right sir? Um, they examined cases who occurred in that time period, I think, who might have been exposed. Yes sir. And they did exposure unexposed they did people that had been exposed for zero to two days and for people who had been exposed to greater than two days in that time period, right? Yes. But for people that were exposed for greater than two days, they found a doubling of the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from exposure to Roundup or glyphosate. Yes. And they found that was statistically significant, that is to say it did not occur by chance. Outside the realm of chance. So now we go to the next page of your table where you report on the study of Erickson, an epidemiological study on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, published in 2008, and exposure to any glyphosate, they've got a doubling of the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma statistically significant, right? Yes. All right, sir. And for greater than 10 days per year use, what did the Erickson study reveal about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma after exposure? to 10 days of glyphosate. For this category of use, it was the relative risk was 2.36, which was statistically significant. And 2.36 would be how much of an increase in risk? It's better if you just say the relative risk. It's the relative risk was 2.36. Okay. Would, would it be an accurate? It's more than doubling. It's more than doubling. All right. And what is dose response? As the level of exposure goes up, the risk or relative risk goes up. Did we see dose response here in the Erickson study for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma exposure to Roundup? Yes. Uh, and the preamble to IR said dose response was strong evidence of causality. Is that true? Yes. All right, let's go to lymphatic, I'm sorry, lymphocytic lymphoma B cell. Do you see that exposure yes. to glyphosate? Tell us what the findings were by Erickson. For this uh, uh, subgroup of lymphoma, the relative risk was 3.35, which was statistically significant because the uh, confidence interval, the lower level, was greater than 1. And I know you don't like to put a percentage on it, but would that be a 300% increased risk? Roughly. Yes, sir. An unspecified non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and exposure to glyphosate, what were the findings and were they statistically significant? The relative risk was 5.63 and the confidence interval did not include one, so it was statistically significant. Would that be synonymous with a five times risk? Roughly. There was only one cancer that the committee found to be associated with a glyphosate, right? Yes. And that's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Correct. And the mechanistic evidence was what, sir? That it was genotoxic and had uh, another possible effect of oxidative stress. Okay. Now, for the first time, we're talking about a study here, the AHS study. Uh, I want to ask you about it. Quote, the AHS cohort did not show a significantly increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So there was a study that did not show the association between, uh, between glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? Yeah. And in fact, you were the author of that study, one of them, right? Sir? One of the authors. And in spite of being the author of the study that didn't show the association, you voted that in fact there was an association exactly. based on the totality of the evidence, right? right. Sir? Yes. Okay. All right, and glyphosate has been detected in the blood 
and urine of agricultural workers and indicating absorption. What does that mean, sir? If it's in the blood, it had to get there somehow. So sure. it had to be absorbed through some tissue. All right. This is uh, a publication, IARC, Monograss, 40 Years of Evaluating Carcinogenic Hazards to Humans. Do you remember that? Yes. And you're one of the authors? Yes. Basically what you were looking at here was to look historically at IARC's findings to see if they'd gotten it right or wrong over the years. Is that a fair assessment? And to discuss the process that they go through. And what you concluded, and correct me if I'm wrong, was, was that I got it right most of the time or wrong? That they get it right most of the time. Yeah. For background, some critics have claimed that IARC working groups failures to recognize study weaknesses and biases of working group members have led to inappropriate classification of a number of agents as carcinogenic to humans. That was the background for which caused you to want to research this subject, right? Yes. What did you do to investigate this to see if, in fact, IR had been getting it right more often than not? Well, we looked at the process that IARC followed, the historical examples of what they had done, and whether or not later changes were made to the evaluations to indicate general agreement with what IARC had done or not. You concluded, you being this group of scientists, conclude that these recent criticisms are unconvincing, right? Yes. Yep. Not real good with numbers, but I'm going to give it a try. One, two, it's over 110 scientists authored this paper. Right. Uh, let's start off uh, where you left off with plaintiff's counsel. Um, you have been doing research regarding cancers in farmers for what, 40 years now? Close. And in fact, you, start, you have publications on uh, cancers and uh, metapoietic cancers in farmers dating back, uh, from my research at least, to 1979? Yes. And there have been uh, epidemiological studies that have associated farming with hematopoietic cancers and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma dating back to the 1960s, right? Yes. That was well before glyphosate was on the market, correct? Yeah. Yes. So it's fair to say that there is some, uh, something going on with farmers uh, that appears to be associated with an increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that predated glyphosate being on the scene, right? Yes. Uh, there is something going on with farmers and their exposures that is leading to an increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that we know for a fact can't be glyphosate, correct? Yes. But when you're studying glyphosate in epidemiology, when you're focusing on glyphosate and farmers, you want to make sure that you, control, that you can control for those other possible confounders to be sure that you are actually studying glyphosate, correct? Yes. Now, your research into farmers has included both case con what's called case control studies and cohort studies, correct? Yes. And you played a significant role, and I think this was referred to briefly in your testimony with questioning from plaintiff's counsel, about the formation of the agricultural health study, correct? Yes. And the agricultural health study um, is a collaborative effort involving the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the United States Environmental Protection Agency, correct? Uh, those three and also the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health and the University of Iowa. And the agricultural health study is what's called a cohort study, correct? Yes. And that is when you get a group of individuals, and in this case farmers, correct? Yes. And you... And their spouses. And their spouses. And you find out uh, various exposures they've had, various um, facts about them before they have any the disease in question that you're going to be studying, correct? Correct. And then you follow them over time to determine whether or not that disease develops or yes. certain diseases develop. And in this case, you brought together 
How many, how many farmers and, and their wives did you gather information on? <coughs> about 80,000. And for those 80,000 then, you obtained information about all sorts of different exposures that they may have had, correct? Yes. And that included obtaining information regarding any exposures to glyphosate, correct? Yes. And at the time you gathered that information, you were, not look, you were looking at exposures, historical exposures going back in time, correct? Yes. And the agricultural health study was initiated um, and formed to address some of the limitations in the earlier uh, case control studies that had been uh, conducted regarding risks of t uh, pesticides or other exposures in farmers, correct? It, it, it was initiated and formed to provide a different design to look at the same issue. It was initiated, at least in part, to address some of the limitations of the case control studies, correct? Yes. And for example, one of the um, limitations of the case control studies was something called recall bias, correct? It's a potential limitation. The agricultural health study was initiated in order to have a study that was examining the possibility of um, exposures, for example, glyphosate and uh, not Hodgkin's lymphoma that did not have this problem of recall bias. Correct. The issue of recall bias is that when you are asking uh, individuals who have a disease already about their past exposures, the concern is that they will recall more exposures than people who don't have the disease, correct? That's a concern. If you have recall bias, then you're going to have an artificial increase in that odds ratio, those numbers we were looking at previously, that is due to the fact that the individual with cancer just recalls more exposures, not that they actually had more exposures, right? And of course, it actually depends on the direction of the bias. It can be either direction. But for a recall bias, if a person with cancer recalls more exposures than a person who doesn't have cancer and hasn't been thinking about that, in if that they recall more exposures, that would be true. If they recalled less, it would be the other direction. Understood. And so the agricultural health study was designed to avoid that problem altogether, correct? Correct. The uh, agricultural health study was also designed to try and deal with issues of uh, misclassification of exposures by going to farmers who you, s you testified earlier have better recall and also <coughs> periodic follow-up, correct? Yes. But at the time of enrollment, the members of the AHS cohort had an average of about 15 years of experience mixing or applying pesticides, correct? Sounds about right. And you have been, just to step back, you've been researching the issues of potential associations between pesticides and cancer for nearly your entire professional career, correct? Correct. The uh, effort to determine pesticides that might be associated with cancers has been your life's work, correct? One of them. You've certainly invested a lot of time um, into um, looking for potential exposure, uh, associations between pesticides and uh, hematopoietic cancers, correct? Yes. And I think you stated that maybe three months before the meeting, um, individuals on the working group would be um, tasked to look at certain parts of the science with respect to the various pesticides that were being reviewed. Correct? To look at the certain parts of? Certain parts of the scientific literature. Yes. Right. Uh, the members of the working group would not be looking at all the scientific literature uh, on a pesticide before they went to the meeting, correct? For example, you didn't look at anything outside of epidemiology, correct? Uh, up until shortly before the meeting when drafts, other drafts were distributed, I think. Okay. But mainly you focused on your discipline okay. and the working group you were in. Yes. Is it also fair to say that prior to that week, that one week meeting, uh, you would be focusing on specific assignments that have been given to you to write certain parts of the monograph? That would be the main focus not the only focus, then the next focus is the subgroup you're in to look at that literature because that's where your expertise lies. Okay. 
the, the work that was being done during that three-month period before the, the meeting, um, the responsibility was to assemble the data and put into tables. It was not to come up with an evaluation during that prior period, correct? Right. So the evaluation process uh, doesn't begin until the start of that one-week period, correct? correct? So you would have maybe a day or two of analysis and evaluation that went into the IR working group's classification of glyphosate, correct? Oh, roughly correct. So, but spread over the five days. Right. So understood. You know, it's important that it's not just done this day and then it's done. Right. No, it's done. You look at it. You think about it. You come back to it. You look at it and think about it. You come back to it. Right. That's a different process than just you got this day. The the evaluation analysis only takes place during that one week period. Correct. Yes. So just so I'm clear, the IARC working group, both the subgroup and the full working group, determined that the evidence of um, glyphosate with respect to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was limited, correct? For epidemiology, yes. yes. The term limited as used by IARC, and as you understood it when you were um, making that finding, is that epidemiology, epidemiology studies have found an association between glyphosate and cancer, but that chance, bias, and confounding could not be excluded as explanations for the finding, correct? Correct. Now, you'd previously, in your previous answer, talked about the separate evaluation that IARC came to as far as overall the two-way classification, correct? So epidemiology is part of that, right? Yes. But the two-way classification for glyphosate was based, um, at least in part, on a separate determination regarding the animal studies, correct? Yes. The two-way classification for glyphosate is based upon the determination that the animal studies provided strong evidence of carcinogenicity in animals for glyphosate, correct? Uh, uh, yes. That's as I recall, because now you're going to the, the subgroup right. that I didn't sit in on, you know, and I just have to remember what they said. Okay. Yes, I think that's right. You discussed earlier that pursuant to the preamble uh, for IARC, IARC only considers scientific literature that is peer-reviewed or um, in publicly available regulatory documents, is that correct? N not just regulatory, it's peer-reviewed or publicly available. Understood. is the key thing. Prior to Monograph 112, the Monograph 112 working group meeting, you were aware of unpublished epidemiological data regarding glyphosate and hematopoietic cancers, correct? Well, I'm hesitating because it means were we working on the pooled analysis at that time, which I think was probably true. In this October 23rd email, Dr. Powell provides a summary of a meeting you guys had on October 20, in which you discussed, in part, the possibility of getting some... Focus this, because we're getting out of focus. Um, Dr. Pawa um, is recounting the discussions you had on October 20 about the possibility of getting some NAPP data on glyphosate published in time for consideration by the Monograph 112 working group, correct? Yes. And during this meeting, you, act, you explained your role on the Monograph 112 working group and the deadline for getting data published for consideration by the working group and its evaluation of glyphosate, correct? Uh, well, is it in here somewhere? Uh, yes, You're saying I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's the final bullet um, on the first page, and it's highlighted on the document, but it starts, Aaron will be the final bullet reads Aaron okay, will be. Okay, closing date, all right, yes. So Aaron will be on the IARC. Yep. Monograph 112 working group on March 3rd to 10 to help evaluate malathion, parathion, yep. okay. diazolon, glyphosate, etc. The closing date for data is February 3rd. Manisha has agreed to lead an analysis of glyphosate and NHL, MM, and HL risks. She will submit a proposal to the NAPP Executive Committee by October 24th. Once approved, a progress check will be done in a month to determine if it's feasible to meet the February 3rd deadline. NHL is the primary cancer site. You see that? Yep. Dr. Harris reports back to the group that the North American Pool Project data 
did not show an elevated risk for multiple myeloma associated with glyphosate, correct? Yes, sir. The adjusted odds ratio for multiple myeloma for ever and never use of glyphosate was 1.23 with confidence intervals of 0 0.86 to 1.76, correct? Yes. That's what epidemiologists refer to as a null finding, correct? No, that's not what they refer to as a null finding. Not, not That's what they refer to as an excess that isn't statistically significant. A non-statistically significant finding, correct? Non-statistically significant excess. Okay. So there was no statistically significant association between glyphosate exposure and multiple myeloma in the NAPP data, correct? Correct. Dr. Harris also reports results with proxy respondents excluded, correct? The last three columns in her table? Yes. A proxy is a next of kin or a spouse, not the actual individual who had the potential exposure, correct? Correct. And uh, generally speaking, self-reported data of the individual uh, who had the exposure is considered more reliable than proxy reported exposure data, correct? Correct. When proxy respondents were excluded, the NAP data, NAPP data showed that the odds ratio for ever and never use of glyphosate and multiple myeloma was 0 0.97 with confidence intervals of 0 0.63 to 1.48, correct? Right. So using the most re reliable exposure data, there was no suggestion whatsoever of any increased risk of multiple myeloma uh, with glyphosate exposure, correct? Correct. So that was a null finding, correct? Yes. And then the second paragraph, the last sentence, um, starting at the end of line two, I expect we will have a draft to review in the next few weeks, and a paper could be submitted early in the new year or before. Correct? Okay, yes. And you are copied on, obviously, this email that sets forth the NAPP data for glyphosate and multiple myeloma, correct? Correct. But despite the fact that you had this data and it was um, in a form that could be submitted for review and submitted for publication uh, in time for the IARC monograph, this data was not, in fact, published in time for the IARC monograph 112 review, was it? Uh, I think not. In fact, the data was not published until June 2016, some 20 months later and well after the IARC working group had conducted its review of glyphosate, correct? Um. And, and I don't think it was submitted to, it, it can be submitted to IARC if it's accepted for publication, but I don't think this was, so I think your answers, your comments are correct. Now, the June 2006... I just want to make the point that it doesn't have to be published, it has to be accepted, which means it's available from the journal. Good clarification. So if you had, you and the other NAPP investigators had submitted this data, it could have been considered by the IARC working group even if it hadn't been published yet. If it had been, it had been accepted, accepted by the journal and up on the journal's website, which happens to, actually one of the papers I got is the website version. It is the same thing as the published thing. But you guys, didn't, you guys didn't do that. You didn't get this data yeah. in a position that the IARC working right. group could consider it, correct? Correct. And you, but you were obviously aware of this data um, during the IARC working group deliberations, right? Yes. Uh, did you mention the NAPP findings um, of no association between glyphosate and multiple myeloma to any of your fellow working group members during the Monograph 112 deliberations? I don't think so, but I don't recall for sure. It wasn't published. Just to be clear, it wasn't published because you guys decided not to publish it, correct? Because we didn't go through the process to get everything ready to send it off for publication. It's still not a sure thing, you understand. You make it sound like you decide then it's done for sure. No, that's not the case. That you work on it, you look at it, you revise, you send it to the journal, you get reviews back from the authors of uh, the reviewers at the journal and so forth, and all that goes into the decision whether you can make it, and uh, we didn't do that. That, that is correct. 16. 16. And Dr. Blair, um, this is a presentation that the North American Pool Project investigators, including yourself, made with respect to what the NAPP data showed for glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? Yeah. Yes. 
And this was presented in June 2015, which was after the IARC, a few months after the IARC monograph uh, 112 meeting, correct? Right. Now, if I can direct you to the first data table in this slide deck, and it's a few pages in, so it'll be this table right here. Okay, we'll put it on the screen. This table presents um, data on what the North American Pool Project had found with respect to glyphosate use and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma risk, correct? Yes. And the first, uh, the overall odds ratio for ever-never use of glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the North American Pool Project is 1.22 with conference intervals of 0 0.91 to 1.63, correct? Correct. So this is basically the same finding that the NAPP had made with respect to multiple myeloma um, back in October of 2014. Almost exact same odds ratios, not statistically significant, correct? Uh, odds ratios that are similar, yes. right? Is that your point? Yes. Yes. Okay. And not statistically significant, correct? Yes. And just like with the multiple myeloma analysis that we looked at before, we also have um, an analysis that breaks out um, proxies and looks only at the most um, reliable exposure data. And I think that is the table, looks like this. I'm, I apologize, it's not, there's no page numbers here. Okay. But in this analysis, proxy versus cell respondents, just as with multiple myeloma finding, when you looked at the NAPP data and you looked at the, most the more reliable self-respondent only data, um, you have an odds ratio for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and glyphosate in the North American Pool Project of 1.04 with a conference interval of 0 0.75 to 1.45, correct? Correct. So again, this is a, a null finding from the North American Pool Project with respect to whether or not glyphosate is associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? Yes. Uh, did you mention these North American Pool Project findings of no association between glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma to any of your fellow working group members during the monograph 112 deliberations? I don't think so. And I, I, I want to say, actually, I don't know whether these were available or not. So you. I mean, whether I even knew about them, because the analysis of multiple myeloma was going on, but I don't know whether this one was done or not. If it was, I'm sure you're going to show me, but uh, I don't know whether this one was done or not. Well, you certainly knew that you had the ability to look at that. You were well, that's a different thing than knowing what it is. We yeah. can look at a lot of things. Is it your testimony that you, in fact, though, then didn't look at that data? Uh, there were a bunch of things going on, and they were already analyzing, and I just don't remember the sequence that got to it. You make it sound like as if you can decide to look at it, and just it's over and done. These things takes months and months and months. And so if you haven't looked at anything at all, the odds aren't good that you can complete it beforehand, before some date. And I think that was part of the thinking about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, that we couldn't get it ready in time. You haven't published your findings with respect to glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma to this day, have you? No. It's now three years later, correct? Scientific research takes time. And because of the fact that you have not published these results, including this finding of a null finding in the North American Pool Project for glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, that information was not available to IARC, correct? No. It was not available, correct? No. I'm going to restate that. It is correct that IARC did not have this information, right? Yes, IARC didn't have it. IARC did not have it. IARC didn't have it. And the various regulatory agencies, including the EPA and regulatory agencies around the world, also have not had this information that, the, that you've been aware of um, with respect to non Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yeah, except. So, okay, I see you're pushing this hard now. So what if we look at frequency of days per year of use? Okay. 
So now, when you look at the people who used it more, they do have an excess of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma among the self-respondents. That, that, now, that's interesting you picked that one out. Why did you not look at duration or lifetime days? There's a lot All, of analyses you picked there, out. There are a lot of them. You, you, you look at a lot of different things, and you have to try to evaluate the whole thing. I picked out one. You picked out one. So, with respect to the um, Deruge 2005 paper, this is a paper that you were uh, studying your co-author on, correct? Yes. And this is the cohort study we've been discussing before and the analysis of uh, cancer incidence among glyphosate-exposed pesticide applicators, correct? Yeah, yes. And if you turn to page 49, the first page actually, on, on the materials and methods section, uh, the Deruse 2005 paper was reporting out the findings from the A AHS cohort based upon exposure data gathered between 1993 and 1997 and incident cancers identified as of December 31st, 2001, correct? Well, the 93 to 97 is correct. I guess the other is. If you read down a little bit further along that same section, you'll see incident okay. cancers. Yes. Okay. And if you go to page 51, table 2, Based on this data, uh, Deruse 2005 identified 92 cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in farmers in the cohort who had been, who had reported exposure to glyphosate, correct? Yes. And Deruse uh, calculated an adjusted risk ratio for ever-never use of glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of 1.1 with a confidence interval of 0 0.7 to 1.9, correct? Correct. Uh, which is a um, showing of no statistically significant uh, association, correct? Yes. And Deruse 2005 also presented data on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, in, and glyphosate in association with the duration and intensity of exposure to glyphosate, correct? Yes. That data is presented on page 52, table 3, and yes. provides analysis of 61 uh, cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in farmers who have been exposed to glyphosate, correct? Towards the bottom of that chart, yes. non-Hodgkin's yes. lymphoma? Yes, yes, yes. For both cumulative exposure days, well, first of all, let me, let me see if I understand this. What is cumulative exposure days in the AHS evaluation? The number of days per year they say they applied a chemical multiplied by the number of years they said they used it. Okay. And um, what is the intensity of exposure? It's those two factors weighted also by um, how they use protective equipment and things such as that would, that would influence exposure. So in the Deruse 2005 paper for both cumulative exposure days, which is this data here, and for um, intensity weighted exposure dates, which is uh, this data here, the uh, relative risk for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was below 1.0 for higher exposures to glyphosate, correct? Correct. So farmers who had either more days of exposure to glyphosate or had more intense exposure to glyphosate had a, high, had a lower incidence lower. of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma than farmers who had not used glyphosate. That correct? was not statistically significant. Right. So this would be a negative association. It wouldn't be a null finding, but it would not be statistically significant. Correct. correct? Okay. In fact, as we discussed earlier, at the time of entry into the agricultural health study, the subject uh, applicators, the farmers, had uh, an average of about 15 years of pesticide use already, correct? Correct. So, on average, by the time the data collected for the 2005 Deruse study uh, was analyzed, the farmers would have had more than 20 years um, have passed from the time of their first exposure to their cancer, potentially, correct? More than 20 years exposure to what? To glyphosate. Some may have, right? Correct. Some may have. Yes. Yeah. Certainly more than 6.7 years. That's not the, the correct year to be looking at for how much exposure they'd had, correct? That's the person year follow-up time. So that was 
the time from questionnaire to follow-up, not exposure to follow-up. Correct. Now, um, in fact, the AHS has conducted additional analyses of glyphosate following the 2005 paper start published study with far larger, a far larger number of incident NHL cases and longer follow-up, correct? There's a paper on that? AHS has conducted analyses of glyphosate oh, okay. Okay. following a 2005 publication with a far larger number of NHL cases and with longer follow-up. I think that's underway, yes. Let me mark as the next exhibit in line, and we'll do this as exhibit A and B. So it's 19A and 19B. So these are drafts yep. prepared in February 2013 and March of 2013, correct? Yes. If you look at the February 2013 draft, um, there is, in fact, starting on the very first page, a comment um, on the draft by an AEB. And that would be you, correct? Aaron Blair. On the first page? Well, you, if you look on the right, you'll see these little comment bubbles. Oh. Um, and if you look throughout the document, you'll see yes. these comment bubbles. Yes. And this, this is your comment. These are your comments on the, yeah. on the document, correct? Correct. And if you look at the March uh, 2013 draft, which is the next document, it also has various comments by you on the publication, on the draft publication, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, let's, um, so it's fair to say that as of March 2013, you had reviewed at least two uh, versions of this draft publication, correct? Uh, yes. Well, let's focus on the March 2013 draft. And if I could turn you first to page six um, in the discussion of the study population. March 2000, oh, March 13. Yeah, yeah, okay, yes, got it. So I can turn you to page six. Six? Yes. And this has a discussion of um, the study population about halfway through, correct? Yes. And now we're looking at um, all, I'm sorry, if you look to page seven, um, all incidents of primary non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the AHS cohort from enrollment through December 31st, 2008, correct? At the very top? Yes. So this study includes an additional seven years of follow-up, um, an additional seven years of NHL cases beyond those that were reported in the published Jerusalem 2005 paper, correct? Uh, yes. And if you look at page nine of this 2013 draft paper, in the second paragraph on that page, it talks about the fact that um, this study also includes additional exposure data from a follow-up questionnaire. So you have five years of additional exposure data um, that was not available for the 2005 study that was published, correct? Correct. Now, I've looked through these tables. The 2013 study does not appear to contain data on ever and never use, but I'd like to have you turn to page 34. And on page, th on page 34 of the document, we have the AHS updated data on glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? Yes. And we have, this is the data for both duration and intensity weighted duration of exposure to glyphosate, correct? Well, I think that's the case. I have to look at the top of the... Not duration, but total days of exposure and intensity weighted days of exposure. Okay. Well, is in total days of exposure the duration of exposure? Uh, not in normal epidemiologic parlance. Okay. Duration is often measured in years, and that can be different than the total number of days. But in the 2005 DeRuze paper, DeRuze wa uh, 2005 DeRuze paper, duration was number of days. And yes, and this is the same. same. It's okay. the so same it's the same analysis same as analysis. in 2005 exposure, yes. uh, 2005 publication, except in this analysis, we have a category also of no exposure, correct? Yes. Okay. 
And the Deruth 2005 uh, analysis that we looked at was based upon, the exposure analysis was based upon 61 cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in farmers who had reported exposure to glyphosate, correct? Uh, that sounds right to me. The 2013 analysis includes data on 250 NHL cases among farmers who had reported exposure to glyphosate, correct? Can just add up the, the three rows of exposure, about 250? About. 200. I, mean, that's, I was looking and said, well, it's not going to add the 250, but it's about um, 250. Okay. I, 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 this 2013 cohort study um, with results for glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is more than four times larger than the Deruce 2005 study, correct? Yes. You've gone from 61 to 62 to 250 cases. Yes. And the confidence intervals for the various analyses of NHL based upon the levels of glyphosate exposure, because it's a larger study, are much tighter than the uh, uh, confidence intervals were for Deruse 2005, correct? Correct. Because this study now has more power, correct? Correct. So this 2013 cohort study finds no association, no evidence of association between exposure to glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? Correct. And based upon the data um, that's set forth here, um, if you look at individuals who had no exposure to glyphosate, which is that first row, and we look at the three categories of individuals who did have exposure to glyphosate, um, if we were to do an ever, never analysis of glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the, idea, the, the relative risk here would be something below 1.0, correct? About, about 0 0.9? No, that's a reasonable guess, I think. Yes. So that means that the incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in farmers exposed to glyphosate in the 2013 cohort study was lower than the incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in farmers who were not exposed to glyphosate, correct? But not statistically significant. So it's a negative association, but not statistically significant. Not statistically significant. And the applicators in the uh, highest levels of exposure to glyphosate, both by lifetime days and intensity weighted lifetime days, had the exact same incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as applica applicators with no exposure to glyphosate whatsoever, correct? Correct. So for the highest, for each of these measures of exposure, for um, the relative risk for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at the highest level, of exposure to glyphosate as compared to non-exposed was a completely null result, correct? Yes. And because of the fact that we now have longer follow-up, the exposure levels at each of these three categories of low, medium, and high exposure to glyphosate also are much higher than the exposure levels in the corresponding analysis in the 2005 published paper. The, the cumulative exposure is higher. Yes. Now, these findings for glyphosate have never been published, have they? Uh, no, they haven't been published. Uh, these findings, the AHS updated findings for glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma were not considered by IARC in its review of glyphosate, correct? No. Uh, these findings also have not been available to any of the regulatory agencies that have been conducting reviews of glyphosate and cancer, correct? Correct. Well, you reviewed this data in March 2013, correct? Yes. At the time that you were the chair of the IARC working group and a member of the epidemiology subgroup that was looking at the evidence of whether or not glyphosate was associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you were aware of this updated data of a study four times larger than the published 2005 paper with respect to glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? That there were analyses of such data, but no published studies. Correct. But you were aware of what the data showed, correct? Yes, but no published studies. Right. And did you alert any of your fellow working group members or any of the other members of the subgroup on epidemiology at IARC about the fact that this much larger AHS cohort study with larger follow, a larger uh, time of follow-up and higher levels of exposure uh, have been conducted? No. But with respect to the meta-analysis that IARC 
conducted. That is mentioned on page 30 of the monograph. So if I could just turn you to page 30 of the monograph. And you see there is the discussion of a meta-analysis. Yes. And it discusses the meta-analysis that was done by Shinazi and Leon, and then an adjustment that the working group made to that monograph, um, I'm sorry, to that meta-analysis, so as to use fully adjusted estimates of uh, the risks with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and glyphosate, correct? Yes. And the IARC working group's uh, conclusion was that the meta-risk ratio um, of all the epidemiology was 1.3 which had a confidence interval of 1.03 to 1.65, so it just made uh, barely that level of statistical significance, correct? Correct. Now, the meta-analysis was based in part on the 2005 AHS publication, correct? Correct. It was not based upon the data we've now just looked at of the 2013 AHS data, correct? Right. Now, as we've already discussed, the 2013 uh, data finds uh, for a much larger number of NHL cases, provide, provides findings for a much larger number of NHL cases. We had like some four times, like 250 cases right. in that data, correct? Right. And the um, confidence intervals, because it's a much larger study, were much tighter in that 2013 data than the, than the data we have here, correct? Correct. And we already talked about the fact that the relative risk from the 2013 data of ever, never use was below one, something like 0 0.9. So it was slightly below the 1.1 uh, relative risk for the Darus 2005 paper, correct? Correct. So if the 2013 data, um, which you were aware of, had been available for IARC in its meta-analysis, the um, AHS data would have had significantly more weight in the meta-analysis than is reflected here. Yes. And the relative risk data would have been lower than the 2005 study that's incorporated here, correct? The relative risk for the AHS study would have been lower. Right. Was lower, yeah. Okay. Yes, it would have been. Yep. So it's fair to say, given that uh, IARC, your, your meta-analysis was just barely statistically significant at 1.03 in the lower bound. If um, IARC had had the data from the 2013 study, much more, uh, much larger study, much greater weight, lower relative risk, that would have driven the meta relative risk downward, correct? Correct. And the meta relative risk with that 2013 data from the AHS study that you were aware of would not have been statistically significant, would it? Uh, don't know, but probably not. Probably not. Now, during the Monograph 112 working group meeting, IARC provided the working group with this meta-analysis data, correct? Yes. Did you mention to anyone at the meeting the likely impact that the more recent data from AHS would have in decreasing the meta-relative risk for glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? No. Now, the NAP data, NAPP data that we were discussing earlier, that's actually a pooled analysis of the data from McDuffie 2001 and DeRuz 2003, correct? Yes. So if we were then to use the, if, we, if the NAPP data had been available to IARC, the data we were looking at previously, you recall that the NAPP odds ratio, um, even including proxy respondents for ever and never use, for glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was 1.22, correct? We looked at that previously. Uh, sounds right. Okay. <laughs> so if the NAPP data, again, that you were aware of at the time, had been available to IARC and had been put into this analysis and replaced McDuffie 2001 and Aru 2003, the odds ratio number for the U.S. and Canadian case control studies would drop from probably somewhere around 1.6 to 1.2 or so, correct? Um, I, you know, I'm not comfortable 
making pronouncements about your combining of data from different studies without me seeing the data. Uh, Dr. Blair, I'd like to continue our discussion of the 2013 AHS data on glyphosate and, or actually pesticides and, and lymphoma risk or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma risk and particularly the glyphosate data. Um, if I could <coughs> ask you to turn to page uh, 84 of that document, Supplemental Table 7. And you had testified earlier this morning about the fact that the definition of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma has changed over time. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. So this data table, Supplemental Table 7, is defining non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as not including multiple myeloma or CLL. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So let's look at the data for glyphosate under that old definition, and that's on page 91. And on the middle of the page, again, we have glyphosate data, both for duration and intensity of use, correct? Uh, yes. And again, we have data on no exposure and then low, medium, and high exposure groups, correct? Correct. Now, the total number of uh, of um, farmers with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in this analysis is 72 plus 51 plus 60, that's about that's 183 uh, farmers, correct? Correct. So with using this data from the 2013 study, uh, the study is about three times larger than the published data from the 2005 study, correct? Okay. <clears throat> and the findings as far as the um, relative risks are concerned are pretty close to what the findings were with the new definition, correct? As correct. far as high <coughs> relative risk? Yes. So as uh, we look at no exposure versus different levels of exposure, the ever-never um, risk ratio is again something like 0 0.9 or so, correct? Probably. Okay. And the same discussion we had previously about how use of this updated data um, in the IARC meta-analysis would lower the meta-relative risk, that same answer would apply for this data as well, correct? Yes. Now, I'd like to take you to um, another part of the analysis in 2013, in the, in the 2013 AHS study, um, with respect to different NHL subtypes. Um, now, let me ask, let's turn first to page 7 of the of the paper because they discuss the different subtypes there. And there are five different groups of subtypes discussed under tumor characteristics. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. So the, this is looking at different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, putting them into categories, correct? Correct. And then there is a separate analysis conducted in this 2013 paper looking at the relative risks for the studied herbicides for each of the different NHL subtype categories, correct? Correct. All right, and that data, that analysis starts on page 69. <clears throat> and, well, specifically on page 69, we have data for glyphosate. Let's look first um, so we can get the categories correct on page 66 the beginning of the table, so we can understand what is what. So page 66 has the different categories of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma on those columns on the top, right? Correct. Okay. And then if you just keep your finger on that page just so you can re re remind yourself which category is which, page 69 is where they have the findings for glyphosate. And I'd like to ask you about the glyphosate finding with respect to on these different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So if you look at page 69, um, the AHS analysis uh, in the first subtype grouping, which is chronic B-cell lymphoma, lymphocytic lymphomas, small B-cell lymphocytic lymphomas, and mantle cell lymphomas. The 2013 age data analysis does not find any association between glyphosate and that NHL subtype, correct? Correct. And the 2013 age data actually finds a statistically significant negative association between increased glyphosate exposure and a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, correct? 
for um, days per year, yes. yes. So in other words, as a farmer has more days of exposure of glyphosate in this study population, uh, his, the incidence of large B cell lymphoma actually decreases, correct? Correct. And that's a statistically significant finding, correct? Yes, trend test. The uh, 2013 AHS data also looks at uh, follicular B cell lymphomas, correct? Yes. And the 2013 AHS analysis does not find any association between glyphosate exposure and follicular B cell lymphomas, correct? No. Uh, deficits that aren't statistically significant. And when you say deficits, what actually they found in this study, again, is as the level of, as a farmer had more days of exposure to glyphosate, the incidence of uh, follicular B cell lymphomas went down, correct? No. It means that at any level of exposure, um, the level, the relative risk was less than one. It was 0.7, 0.6, correct, good correct, good correct. does not go down. So in, in what the 2013 AHS data reveals is that any level of exposure to glyphosate resulted in a lower incidence of follicular B-cell lymphomas, correct? Lower, lower incidence or lower relative risk isn't statistically significant. And with respect to the um, category for other B cell, other B cell type lymphomas, again we see that with any level of exposure to glyphosate, the incidence of B cell type lymphomas, the relative risk, goes down. Correct? It's lower. And if you look at the point estimate for relative risk, both for the other B cell type lymphomas and the follicular B cell lymphomas, at that highest level of, of uh, exposure, the relative risk is uh, 30 to 40 percent lower for farmers with that highest level of glyphosate exposure compared to farmers with no exposure, correct? Correct. Did you inform anyone at the IARC working group that, AHS, that uh, the agricultural health study had conducted additional analyses of glyphosate for various NHL subtypes? No, because it wasn't published. And the analysis, when you look at it this way, for glyphosate only, in the atrazine, glyphosate atrazine um, analysis, glyphosate only is 0 0.96. For glyphosate only with the glyphosate N24D, it's 1.1. For glyphosate only and glyphosate and chlordane, it's 0 0.9. So in the glyphosate only portions of this, again, we're not showing any increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? Correct. For farmers who are exposed to both glyphosate and atrazine, there is no statistically significant increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? Correct. For farmers exposed to both glyphosate and 2,4-D, there is no statistically significant increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, correct? Correct. Uh, yes. And this is also information that the IARC working group did not have at the time it made its analysis of glyphosate, correct? Correct. Now, I'd like to show you um, another document that was <coughs> from your production to us. And this is an email between you and some of the other agricultural health study investigators in February of 2014. Um, first of all, who is Dr. Alavanha? Alavanya. Alavanya. He was an uh, uh, investigator at the National Cancer Institute and was involved in the agriculture health study. Is he, is he an epidemiologist as well? Yes. And you agree that the AHS provides important data regarding potential associations between pesticides and cancer, correct? Yes. You agree that the AHS data and the most updated AHS data should be considered by IARC, correct? Yes. So the issue is we're weighing the positive case control studies that f more than a few of them, but the jury's heard of by now, that show the association, statistically significant, between glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the negative study, AHS, which really didn't show a statistically significant association, right? Correct. And you, Dr. Blair, are one of the authors of that AHS study, right? Yes. 
Yet when it came time to vote as a volunteer scientist on the International Agency for the Research of Cancer, you voted unanimously with your 16 of your peers that there was a probable association between glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? Well, I voted that way. I think it was unanimous. I don't actually remember. And I might not be pronouncing this right, but Michael Alavanya? Alavanya. Excuse me. Michael Alavanya is one of the authors of the AHS study, isn't he? He is. Here is an article that Dr. Alavanya wrote that came out. I'm sure we get the date right. In 2013, yes, okay, which was about, which was the same year as you had your AHS data, right, that you talked about so much, the same year that you had that, that AHS data, right? Okay. Uh, yes, this paper's in the same time for And he says glyphosate positively associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That's what he says. Yes, sir. And uh, following up on counsel's questions, you certainly never wrote a letter to Dr. Alejandro, your co-author, and said, gee, you're wrong when you say that glyphosate is positively associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I did not. Okay. And, and I think the jury's going to hear a lot about this, but I want to ask you, this AHS study was a cohort study, right? Yes. And these other studies, the case control studies, that upon which the positive association with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's a different kind of epidemiological study, right, as compared to a cohort study. Yes. And then one of the problems, all studies have problems, and no studies are perfect. Is that fair? Fair. Sure. And one of the other problems with cohort studies like the AHS study is loss to follow-up. You've heard that phrase before, haven't you? Yes. Tell the jury what loss to follow-up means, Doctor. Let's in go. cohort studies that you have to keep following people and in an open society, uh, it's hard to do. And, and, and look, we know you and Dr. Alondra are hard-working scientists that are working at this issue when you prepared that cohort study, the AHS study. But the truth is you had lost the follow. We did. Yeah. All right, so here we are, doctor. Statistically significant information from a study that you authored with others. Now, this is an abstract, right, sir? Yes. Explain to jury what an abstract is. Uh, different... Uh scientific associations have meetings of their members and at those meetings there will be verbal presentations and you get accepted to be on the program by submitting an abstract to decide who gets to be on the program and these are the abstract this is one of those abstracts sure. so it's not a full paper but it's a and the synopsis of what some work someone has done they're willing to talk about all right sir and it's a uh Presented at the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, right, yes. sir? Yes. And that was at their 2015 conference, right, sir? Uh, I think so, yes. All right, sir. And so the jury understands it was an evaluation of glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, right? Yes. And the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, major yes. histological subtypes in the North American Pooled Project, right? Correct. And you are one of the authors, Aaron Blair from the United States Cancer Institute, right? Yes. Okay. <coughs> and Dennis Weinberger, I'm sorry, Weisenberger from the City of Hope Hospital, right? Yes. And among many others, right? A mm -hmm. Kenneth number of others. Yes, sir. And what you scientists found statistically significant and presented to the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology was several uh, findings. Results. Cases who ever used glyphosate had elevated non-Hodgkin's lymphoma risk overall with an odds ratio of 1.51, statistically significant, right? Yes. Okay. And as a scientist, statistical significance is important, isn't it? Yes. Subjects who used glyphosate for greater than five years had an increased odds ratio that was higher, 2.58, right? 
Uh, yes. And that shows us dose-dependent response, right? Yeah, okay, yes. And dose-dependent response is strong evidence of causality, is what the uh, preamble to the IR tells us, right? Yes. Compared to non-handlers, those who handled glyphosate for greater than two days slash year had significantly elevated odds of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma overall. Odds ratio of 2.66. Was that statistically significant, Doc? Yes. Okay. And it goes on to tell us about various subtypes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? Correct. And DLBCL, what's that? Diffuse B cell chronic leukemia. Tri triple the risk of diffuse B cell non Hodgkin's lymph. Coma, yeah, it's fine. Right, sir? Statistically significant? Yes. As a result of exposure to glyphosate? Yes. And this is information that was reported out after IARC found the positive association between glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? Yes. But you couldn't tell IARC about this positive finding from this a NAP study because it hadn't been published in March when you were in your IARC meetings in Lyon, France, right? Correct. Has anything you've been shown by Monsanto's lawyers in the three hours and 40 minutes that he questioned you changed the opinions that you had at the IARC meeting about glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Uh, no.